Well, thank you everyone for joining us today on this week before the official kickoff to a new school year. Uh, we'll be focusing the next two hours on how we can set up a literacy rich environment in your K-1 classrooms. And uh, I am Lisa Thomas, I'm the program manager and a teacher consultant for Poppy and I'll be co-presenting today with my colleague, Jen Kelly, who's up in the Shushwap area. So as we mentioned, you can get all of the workshop resources on Poppy's Padlet. So this is something new that we're trying this year. If you've been with us to other workshops in the past, this is a new addition for us. So if you've already been there, you'll see on the left column, we've got handouts, there was a Zoom link and info, and then the articles, videos, and resources that we'll be sharing this morning. This afternoon, we're also doing the same session with a focus on two, three. So a little bit of the same content, but some different one targeted to those older students. So the resources for both of our sessions today are available on our Padlet. As always, we've got lots of other literacy focused resources on our website at poppy.ca. And so our goals and objectives for our time together this morning, really what we're going to be looking at is how we can create a responsive and caring classroom by intentionally planning routines and structures um, that we can give our students those multiple opportunities to engage in literacy activities throughout the day that are meaningful, connected, and personal and engaging for our students. So that's what we'll be focusing on. As always, we'll show you some examples. Um, we'll show some videos, we'll share some stories, and we'll get you to engage with us in the chat box. We'll have one breakout room a little bit later and uh, some music to keep things engaging and interactive as well, because we want to practice what we preach. If we look at the research on learning, knowing that it's social, constructive, experiential, and inquiry-based, we probably didn't think about learning how to drive or swim or ride a bike as being inquiry-based, but there is a lot of exploration as well as that we do all of these things socially. We don't do them on our own. We have the support of other people. So here's a few things that we have on our list for how we learn, and a lot of it you have already shared in the chat box. So we'll see if any of these resonate with you. So observing someone's skill, doing a model or demonstration of what the activity looks like, Sometimes there's direct instru instruction. I think a lot of you alluded to that gradual release of responsibility. We don't just get thrown in the deep end if we're lucky, uh, right at the start on day one. And the practice and the repetition, so important. So having the time and opportunity to, to do it at a pace that works for us gradually. We all talked about encouragement and feedback, safety to take risks and try new things, and then also the social piece, the relationships and who we're learning with and from are so important for us to feel safe and comfortable taking those risks. And then are we motivated and engaged? So I know with a lot of us, for me, like I said, I was really motivated to learn to drive because it was gonna give me some independence and freedom that I was really looking forward to. So that motivation made sure I bought in and I really took it seriously and I really tried my best and was engaged. So if we wanna think about that for our students, our focus is with literacy, but of course with everything, we're setting up our classroom to have a really positive, supportive climate and year with our students. So just thinking about if this, this is how we learned and it worked well for us, how can we cultivate that in our classroom? And the flip side of that is I'm sure we all have experiences from learning on one of these activities that maybe didn't go so well. Maybe something was a little bit of a struggle or a challenge or frustration, or we might've labeled it as a failure or a setback. So what was missing for us in those times of struggle and challenge and frustration? And what would we have wished that we could have received in those learning moments that weren't as positive and weren't as supportive? So keeping that in mind, um, how can we take what we learn from what we know about ourselves to support that for our students? So any connections or thoughts there for a connection you could make to applying it to your classroom, your environment or your schedule? Uh, feel free to put that in the chat box, but we're going to keep moving on. But sh please share as we go any connections um, that you have as we work through uh, 
a workshop. So that builds on to this creating a responsive and caring classroom. Uh, this is from a really wonderful book. I'm just gonna move my toolbar here. My mouse is giving me uh, some grief. Um, Jen, you can confirm maybe, I sure. think this is from the first six weeks. The first six weeks and also uh, purposeful play. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so as we know in BC, we've brought in the core competencies since 2016. They've really been at the forefront um, of the K to three curriculum with some beautiful, natural, easy tie-ins to literacy and the ELA curriculum. So especially in K1, so much of what we're doing to support our children to be successful, it's the social and the interpersonal and the self-reg that needs to be nurtured and encouraged, the modeling, the demonstration, the time, the practice, the opportunity. We really need to be doing the social and the social emotional piece for students so that they have a platform for being able to engage and focus in on the learning for the academic things. So, and so much of their academic and cognitive, the brain development comes through social interactions, through problem solving, conversation, communication, collaboration, and having the safety and familiarity of good guidelines routine, structure, familiarity, and predictability really helps our students to feel safe so they can take risks and they're not feeling anxious or worried about what's coming next with a bunch of unknowns. So the other piece is about knowing our kids and this September is such a wonderful time for getting to know our students, what their story is, what their family is like, what makes them excited what they're curious to learn about, what their needs are, what their strengths are, and how we can support them. So having class meetings can be a really wonderful way to build community, get to know our students as a teacher, but also to help our students get to know each other and find those connections and commonalities with their peers. And then what we can do, thinking about getting them to, to eventually be independent reading and writing workshop, literacy centers to get them. Again, the time and opportunity to practice these skills, they're going to be doing it gradually over time. Obviously, reading and writing is so complex. They're not going to be reading and writing and learning how to do it all within a few months. This is something that it does take years from K to three for them to become fluent and independent, higher level readers and writers. So when we have them in kindergarten and grade one, we're laying that critical, critical foundation for them and so much of that is engaging with story and getting them to see that stories can be a joyful source for them and how they can engage with story as readers and writers and learn everything there is to learn about language and words and literacy. So the morning meeting and this is from the first six weeks of school, which is a fabulous book. I used it both in, in primary and in intermediate with my students. Um, so the research on it, all of these benefits here, welcoming the children, setting a positive tone for the day, building trust, student confidence. So yeah, having a context for practicing academic skills in an informal social way, we're building cooperation, inclusion, they're working on their communication skills. So not just talking, but also listening and being able to respond and ask each other questions. So the morning meeting is one of those routines you can bring in and do every day, but then within it, so it's a predictable event and part of your schedule in the morning, but within that, what it might look like changes from day to day. Again, we're building up kids' familiarity, comfort and safety. Um, September's a really nice one to do and we'll do something like this next just thinking about asking the kids what was the highlight of their summer break what are some things that they got up to finding what maybe what the favorite book was that they read um, adventures if they did any traveling or camping or things like that and finding out also, the students are going to find out what each other did, and that's going to build a connection for them as well. 
So the, the general format for the morning meeting is quite simple with four parts. So greeting, taking 30 seconds, everybody goes around, greets each other. It's a little bit of a round robin, kind of a fast track. They can do a clap, handshake, high five, elbow bump, whatever we're doing. And then taking time to share something. So for example, this is a great time to do summer sharing, like I said, but it could be another time everybody share your favorite food or your favorite book or bring in a souvenir from your summer or bring in your favorite stuffy. So doing things together, it could be a game. It could be tied to word work, tied to literacy. Learning their names is a really nice thing to do also at the beginning of the year whose name starts with the letter N, all that kind of stuff. And then we can also do some announcements. So it might tie into some reading and writing if we have a morning message posted or doing some interactive writing with them and doing a read aloud. So lots of opportunity there to tie it naturally into the literacy that we'll be doing in our literacy block. So with us, we kind of did our own morning meeting when we focused in on the swimming, and the riding a bike and the driving a car. If we were together in person, we would have shared orally and it would have been an actual real conversation. So the chat box did that for us. Um, so it was virtual instead of being all in person together on the carpet. Um, but if you think about, we shared already what, what you taught. We talked about our experience learning when we were younger. Now it'll get you to do share. What's your favorite memory from your summer break? Enter that into the chat box. So feel free, enter your favorite summer memory in the chat box. Oh, thank you, swimming with your daughter, family barbecue, local ingredients, uh, going for morning swims, horseback riding. Oh, getting a new puppy. Riding horses, hiking, swimming, bodyboarding, gardening, sketching. Ocean kayaking, stand-up paddleboard. Nice. Yeah, so Jenna, I have a connection. I've got a stand-up paddleboard. I got out as much as I could this summer and did better at standing uh, for longer without falling in. So that's something if we were together in our classroom, I would want to seek you out and talk about that. So it's a good way you can see where we make connections or there's something that I'm interested in. I might ask Jasmine about sketching and watercolors because I'm curious about that. So for us here, we could look through, find somebody else's share, something, and we could respond to it. So I could invite you in a really structured way. Okay, someone shared. I see Jennifer's talking about free time, time outdoors. I might ask you, Jennifer, what's one of your favorite things you did outdoors? So reading at the beach, going for a hike, swimming. So we're learning a lot from each other and about each other to make a connection and a bond as we move on with our day. All right, so I'm gonna pass it over to Jen and we're gonna dig into looking a little bit more at designing our learning spaces. So the environment in our, in our room and what that can look like to be maximally supportive for our students. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so if we consider our classroom environment, it's such an important place to, to think about designing because we're going to spend a lot of time in that space. Our students are going to spend a lot of time in that space. Um, and we want it to be a place where we want to walk into in the morning and, um, and our students feel warm and welcome. So one of the things that Lisa and I love about our job is that we get to see classrooms across BC. We get to see um, how teachers have set up and designed their specific spaces with their students' unique needs in mind. So this can change year to year based on who our students are and what we're focusing on. Um, but it's such an exciting place. I just feel an energy when I walk into to a classroom and, and talk with teachers about why they decided to design it specific ways and 
really um, teachers are so thoughtful about um, their space and what's going to work for their students. So having, you know, easily accessible areas for diverse abilities, um, having places where students can go to feel safe and calm and quiet. Um, classroom library is usually a really exciting space that, that teachers are get really excited about sharing. So I'm going to ask you, let's have some sharing time. What is your favorite area of your classroom and why? And um, hopefully we can learn from each other and gather some tips and tricks about how to make our classroom environment environments even more lovable. So I'm going to put a timer on for a minute and you can just pop that into the chat box. Okay, isn't this amazing? So many of you talked about similar areas. So we have um, loose parts and story bin corner. Lots of people talked about a corner or a cozy place to read or um, a place to look at nature and bring nature into the classroom to continue the study. Um, Definitely. Oh, great. A new classroom. Yeah, Jasmine, I know that's kind of like a blank slate, right? You have like a lot of different areas that you can play around with. We're going to get into that next. And um, comfiness. I, I just, by reading your comments about where your favorite places are, I just feel a sense of comfort and safety and calmness. Um, and that's so great. Really interesting to see so many commonalities among our favorite places. Okay, so as we consider our uh, designing our learning spaces, probably a lot of you are considering thinking about what, what can provide that literacy rich environment for our students. And environmental print is a really important one. So really um, having a lot of different materials around, the, around your space that are very intentional and um, that students can use to help aid their learning. So a lot of these are constructed with students, um, built upon through the year so that our students continually have those environmental print materials around them to access and refer to and build on as their learning continues. So this is everything from clocks to um, uh, charts with, you know, um, students' names on them, connected to faces, to word walls, to sound walls, so many different ways that we can bring environmental print into our classroom in a way that is purposeful for our students to use to continue to build on their learning. Anchor charts are really an important way that we can um, connect our students to that, that permanent and visible learning that they can refer to. So the thing with anchor charts is that sometimes they don't look really pretty. Sometimes they don't look like Pinterest anchor charts. A lot of times when we're building the, those with students, we want our students to be able to easily understand and reference them. So we want them to take ownership of that. So sometimes, you know, they don't look like they uh, are the most beautiful thing in the world, but they're so important to us and so important to our students. So we want them to be there for them to build on their learning as well throughout the year. And classroom libraries. So as we, as lots of you mentioned, the book bins, the different ways that we organize books, how wonderful when we can invite our students into that organization process. And um, not only do they get a sense of ownership for their library when they help to organize and, and take care of the library, but also they know what's there, so it's easy access when they go to find a new book and um, they can be a part of, you know, organizing when a new book comes in. Oh, we have a new book from Scholastic today. Let's figure out where it should go in our library. I'll read the first couple of pages or I'll read the, the synopsis and, and we can decide together. So it's more of a community building process. Okay, so this is kind of an exciting thing to think about. Your classroom plan, whether you're brand new to a classroom, like you mentioned, or whether you've been in the same classroom for a while and want to see if there's something you want to change or spice up in, in your room. So I'm going to have you draw a quick map, map of your classroom. Um, you can start with just the built-in features that you can't change, like the sink and the smart board. And then is there anything that you would want to change to make you love your classroom even more? 
So it could be how you're um, situating your tables. It could be, you know, the, that cozy corner that people are talking about. Is that something that you want to add to your classroom? So I'm going to give you two minutes and, um, and just have two minutes to reflect and think about your classroom, do some creative designing, and then we'll come back together. Okay, hopefully that was enough time just to get started with thinking about this. Um, and, and hopefully um, you had a little bit of reflection and creative time. We don't sometimes have a lot of that at the beginning of the year. So um, hopefully that was enough. And we are going to move on and switch gears a little bit. So we've talked about making our classroom a welcoming place. We've talked about designing it with our students' needs in mind. Um, many of you talked about making sure our, your students feel safe and comfortable and have, have that special place to be. So now we're going to switch gears and think about how we can create that sense of belonging for our students as individuals in all of their uniqueness. So how can we um, ensure that our students know that they are invited into our classroom to be who they are and to celebrate who they are and be welcomed for who they are? And who better to do that than Todd Parr? So a quick book, and then we're gonna do an activity with this. Doesn't he just say it so directly and well and um, in such a, a, a lovely way? So I, I love using Todd Parr books as mentor text because he's such a personable author that um, our students really relate to him. But we are going to take this a step further and think about how Todd Parr has a certain way of um, drawing his portraits to make them a little silly, colorful, uh, relatable, and in no way do they have to be perfect. So this is what we're gonna do now. Um, using the lovely examples of Lisa and I, can you tell which is which? Is which? Who's who? <laughs> Uh, you can. <laughs> There's a whole lot of curls there. <laughs> <I know. laughs> My curls are shorter, <laughs> I think. And and of course, yeah, green hair, purple hair, pink hair, whatever. So we're going to have you draw a self portrait using any colors or ideas that you want. You can just feel free to go in full Todd Parr style. And then, if you'd like, you can. You may decide to label some of the parts if you can see. One of the portraits is, is labeled using some words and some students might be ready to write a whole sentence. So that's the other example there. Um, at the end of the timer, so I'll give you a little bit of time to work on this, um, you will have a takeaway. So you could do this activity with your students if you want and already have your own self portrait to share with them. And how cool would that be to already have something to connect to your students. So this is my self-portrait. I'm putting myself out there. I'm taking risks. These are the things that are important to me uh, if you choose to do an activity like this with your students. So I will give you, how long am I giving you? Three minutes to do this activity. And then we're going to um, do some sharing. So don't worry about what it looks like. Todd Parsville, three minutes. <laughs> <gasps> okay, so on to thinking about our learning, our literacy rich environment. Now let's think about our whole learning environment and include the outdoors. Um, one of the wonderful things that was really emphasized during um, the pandemic was all the different learning that can happen outside of our classrooms. And, um, and I mean, we were doing a lot of outdoor learning before that, but I think it became a little bit more important to the forefront. So look at all of the different things that our students can learn when we are leading a nature or forest walk. So if we just notice their engagement through identifying, sketching, labeling, seeing all those literacy rich words come to the forefront and all the different things that we can notice and identify in our environments, um, really extend our vocabulary, extend um, our language comprehension. And then, you know, really considering those describing words and questions that come up as, um, as we take our students outside and extend our literacy rich environment 
to include the outdoors. So I had the wonderful fortune of going for a forest walk with a group of kindergarten students. And um, it was something that they did every Tuesday afternoon, rain or shine. And it was their favorite time of the week. Loved it, loved it. So I came in kind of late to the game. They had already been doing their nature walks or their forest walks all year. And I joined them in the spring. So they were very used to this this idea of engaging with nature. And what I observed as an outsider was how much um, listening and um, discussing and collaborating and um, questioning that came up as students were going through their forest walk together. And it was, it just really hit me that that was such a wonderful natural way for us to um, deep in that language comprehension, deep in that language development for our students. And then it extended, of course, to the classroom because there was very exciting things that needed to go back to the classroom to continue to learn about. And, um, you know, story workshop and all of those really wonderful things that were, um, that were, the, the excitement was heightened by these forest walks. So just had to make sure that that was part of what we were doing with our literacy rich environments. And of course, we can't talk about a literacy rich environment in a K-1 class without talking about books. So I'm going to focus in on one aspect of a very important aspect of having books in our classroom, but how we can really utilize mentor texts in our classroom and um, really use them as a co-teacher for us. So we, we, it's really important when we're looking at books that we can focus in on um, the details of the written language that Lisa was mentioning earlier and, and notice that texts um, are read in different ways and they're, they're, there's, lots, there's no one way to write a text and um, ensuring that our students notice the differences between how Todd Parr writes and how um, other, other people write so that they can start to get into their mind so that they are a writer and they can develop their own style. And they can even use, you know, someone else's style when they want to as well. Okay, so in order to do this, I could have used a Todd Parr book because, you know, it's Todd Parr day and everything, but I wanted to introduce you to this fabulous book that um, Kennard Pack wrote, Goodbye Summer, Hello Autumn, because it's so fitting for right now in our world and when we're inviting our students back into our classrooms next week. So what I would love for you, for you to think about is how could you use this as a mentor text? What are you really zoning in on? Um, how could you connect um, more learning to this book as well? Sit back, enjoy this and have those reflection questions in your mind. It's not a lovely book when you think about just um, honoring, you know, the end of summer and the beginning of autumn and noticing and, um, you know, all the different things that are happening in our world right now. So let's take it a step further. So considering how, um, how Kennard Pack describes the late summer turning into autumn, we're going to invite you to take a quick walk around your environment, wherever you are, and um, notice things changing from summer to autumn. You might wanna take a notepad and just draw some pictures or in words, or you might wanna take some photos. And we're gonna give you seven minutes to do this, which isn't a long time, but I think it'll give you enough, of, enough time to notice at least a couple of things around your world. And when you return, we'll just have you choose one of your noticings that you can describe in the chat box. And again, what a wonderful thing to share with your students. Oh, last week I was at a workshop and I noticed all of these different aspects of um, welcoming autumn into our life. Okay, so, so we'll do that for seven minutes. Um, I have a timer that is three minutes, so I will, start that, I'll, I'll start the timer just to, so you have a little bit of a cue to come back and, um, and then you can pop your noticing into the chat box after that seven minute mark. All right, welcome back. Hopefully everybody's back or settling back into uh, at their desk, at their computer. 
and hopefully you withstood the temptation to do some tasks or prep <laughs> in your room uh, during that seven minutes and you actually were able to do a walk around, um, maybe even outside. Um, and you were able to take uh, some notes on what you noticed about your environment for the changing of the seasons. Um, if you're high tech and fancy in the chat box, you can share an image, I think, uh, where the three dots is, I think, or on the little piece of paper with a thing folded over, you can share a document. Uh, that's a little bit fancy. So if you can just, oh, here we go. Thank you. Denise, Carrie, enter in the chat box something that you can put easily into words. What's one of your noticings that you saw on your uh, your nature walk, even if it was just looking out the window. So we've got seed pods, bumblebees, grasshoppers, and ripe grapes. That sounds beautiful, Denise, very, almost like poetry. Sound of crickets, leaves starting to change color, leaves and plants changing, no more cut flowers from the garden, oak tree dropping acorns, leaves changing and beginning to fall, tomato plant <laughs> wilting a little bit. It was a good summer for tomatoes, that's for sure. Uh, so we really love this type of activity because it brings in that element of inquiry for our students and noticing and close observation and how powerful that can be, especially in K-1 when they have so many questions and they do notice so much about what's going on around them. So for us to guide them in some intentional conversations about what they're noticing, a really nice launch off point from that, <clears throat> if you wanted to build on it, is after you look at what they've noticed, based on what they've noticed, what are some things they might be wondering? So they might have some questions about why leaves change color, why they fall off the tree, something about acorns. If they planted an acorn, would a tree grow in your classroom and start as a little sapling? So you can follow the noticings to get their questions and then use their questions to do some experiments, some exploring, some research together, investigating with some books, try to find answers in books in your classroom, maybe online, in your library, talking to other teachers, talking to their family, seeing what they notice at home, if they have a yard or a deck and sharing that and watching. The nice thing about this is we've got the four seasons through the year, so we can always have them be noticing the changes in the weather and what's happening to the plants and trees, animals around them as the seasons and the months change. A really nice activity to nurture that experimenting, the noticing and questioning. So having that scientific mindset as they look around them at nature, which they're naturally doing anyways. So as we shift from looking at that and doing some reading and some stories and the Todd Parr and focusing on themselves and being proud of who they are, we wanna shift in a little more deeply now in the last stretch of the workshop into how we can support them in their early, early reading and writing. So what I'm going to focus on here is looking at some examples and what a typical range of writing can look like. So that writing development in our earliest writers. So you can see their linear marks that sort of look like letters. So they're trying. And then some mock letters and random actual letters combined and then random strings of actual letters, random strings of letters and visual memory. So maybe they're putting in some words they know, like their name, their first word for most kids, and then invented uh, spelling. So that one there on the bottom right, rainbow cat, and she's got her name. So a shift for us and a shift for students is if they can be doing this type of work, for us to reinforce and encourage them that they are writers. Even at the beginning of K, if they can put a pencil to paper and make any lines at all, even if they look like that top left, that is them writing, that is them telling a story, they're communicating, they're sharing what they know and they're documenting it. 
So we can have students reframe their identity to have them believe in themselves as writers, even though it doesn't look like the writing that we're sharing in our books and writing that older students are doing in the higher grades. This is them learning how to write. And just like riding a bike, learning to swim or drive a car, it takes a lot of time, a lot of repetition, a lot of practice, a lot of opportunity, direct instruction, and so much of it is around modeling. So what these students are doing here is they're imitating, imitating and echoing what they have seen, either things that we have written for them, that environmental print around the room, and also in all of the books that we're sharing with them. So for example, here, here's a student's uh, beautiful picture and they're writing. So we can help students name what their writing skills and strategies are, what actions they're doing to help reinforce to them the skills and strategies we're wanting them to see and acquire and practice as early writers. So by asking really intentional specific questions, we can help them to understand and see themselves that way. So for example, here, this is so lovely. How did you decide which colors to use? Really nice question. We're curious. We want them to tell us more about their writing. That gives them the message, you're a decider. You decided which colors to use. So that's going to build up their esteem, their identity as a writer, rather than if we go and talk about, oh, your letter formation or, the, you know, your letter spacing, you're missing a finger space. This is developmentally appropriate for what we're wanting to see in our early writers. So and here's another one. And so comment or question, you have lots of letters here. How did you think of which ones to put where? can send a message to let them know you're intentional. I believe you did all of this on purpose with a reason and I'd like you to tell me your reasons for how and why you made these choices because that's what writers do. They make choices all the time about what they're going to include on their page when they're writing. So we've got a couple more here and we'll get you to look at them and think of something that you could, what kind of messages we're sending to the students with our questions. So looking at this piece of writing, if we ask a student, what do you think you're going to do next in your book? What kind of message would that be sending to the student? And then this one here, this lovely one Joseph did, asking, have you ever written about flowers before? So what kind of messages could these be sending to our students? If we think about building up their identity and belief in themselves as writers and noticing and giving positive affirmation for a skill or a strategy or focus that they are already using at a very beginning stage. I'll just put a short music timer on here and please, what do you think these two questions, what messages do you think that they're sending? Um, I'll show you the examples here from this fabulous book. So a question like, what do you think you're going to do next in your book sends a message like this. So just like Tiffany said, you're a planner. So we're giving them credit for having planned it out and thinking ahead the next time they write a book, what they might do. Yeah, so the power to decide what to write about, they can control their story. It's the empowerment piece is a huge part of motivation and engagement and that excitement. Yeah, thank you, Marcy. So the teacher's letting them know I can read your story. So and with the, have you ever written about flowers before? Sends a message like, you have a history as a writer. So looking back at other work you've done, and it does, it places their current experience in, you've written in the past and I believe you're gonna write in the future. You are a writer. As Jasmine says, you are a continual writer. So these are really powerful messages for our students that can really support and foster their engagement in all of that time and opportunity and repetition and practice for them to become writers. So when we look at the same thing, but flip it over to reading, any approximations they are making are great. 
they're trying to replicate what they hear us do, what their uh, their parents do, older siblings, when they are being read to and shown how to read a book. So they're getting some of that modeling and direct instruction, the time, the practice, the repetition, the exposure to different types, genres, different forms of reading and story and text. And so the research shows for students to be approximating or trying is based on, we want them to be doing that. Kind of like with us learning to swim, riding the bike, every attempt is an approximation, getting them closer to being able to successfully complete the task or do the task on their own. So believing every student is ready for something, some level of engaging with text, we can really make it playful, building up their confidence by having that safe environment, we want them all to be moving along and progressing. So it's not about perfection. And as we know, they're all on a long learning journey of literacy that's going to take them through K, one, two, three, and into intermediate. How important that oral rehearsal piece is. If they can tell you a story orally and then try and get it on paper, even if it is just a drawing or some, some lines that maybe look like letters, that is okay. We're helping them to understand that stories and ideas and thoughts that they have in their minds can be shared out loud and then we can get them on paper. And so texts are ideas and stories written down to make that the, the print concepts and the connection between oral language and oral story and what they can write and also in what they can read. So we wanna make sure that they really have a lot of exposure to these concepts to help breed that comfort, their enthusiasm and the confidence so that they will want to try when they show up tomorrow, they have a track record. I am a writer, I have been writing for a while, I'm gonna continue writing more and more, I'm gonna continue reading more and more. So with using familiar books and non-familiar books, there are benefits to both of them. With familiar books, that's where we can slow down and really dig into focus on showing them those meaning making strategies or language development using picture clues to support their comprehension and the practicing things really on a simple level, how we navigate a book and all those concepts of print. And with unfamiliar books, that's where we can really tap in and have students make predictions or do in inferring what might happen next. What do you think is happening here based on the text on the page that I've read to you, looking at the picture, what cues and clues do you have about where this story might be going? What's this character thinking? So bringing students in with an interactive read aloud, sharing a book with them that they don't know about, it's building up their sense of empowerment. They've got the curiosity, what's going to happen next because they don't know, they're not familiar with it. And really we can draw them to make careful, close noticing and attention on those illustrations and the details within all of the pages across all of the pages in the book. Um, but with our youngest readers, those familiar books over time, rereading some classic, wonderful books that build up on those, all the things that we want them to do as word solvers, the phonics, phonological, phonemic awareness, we can be doing that with familiar books for them. So. Eric Carl, we're going to do that as an example of using a familiar book. And you can see there's a question there for you down at the bottom. As we read this, think about and share in the chat box, how can you use, or how could you use this book or a book like this to teach pre-reading skills? So what could you be pausing to point out or draw students' attention to? What questions might you ask students as you go through the pages of this lovely, simple, beautiful book with a lot of repetition and patterning. So please feel free, share your thoughts in the chat box as we go through the story. Okay, so for the final little bit of our workshop today, we're going to focus in on some other pre-reading activities. Um, so Lisa already mentioned concepts of print and how important it is for our students to know how to navigate our book. Um, how to navigate books. So our students come to us with a variety of background knowledge. 
some students will have a very good idea about um, navigating books, like locating where's the front of the book, where to begin reading, what's the difference between a letter and a word, all of those different things, uh, depending on their exposure to um, uh, reading at home, having books around, um, interest in books. So all of those different things are going to impact the students that come to us and what they need. So it's really important for us to notice what concepts of print they do have down pat and what we need to explicitly teach. And we can explicitly teach a lot of these things like the first word of a sentence, um, punctuation marks, um, all of those things we can, we can do through the morning message, like Lisa mentioned earlier. Um, we could do that through some shared reading activities. We could do it in small groups. So really get to notice that, get our students to notice that um, there's so much to know about navigating a book before we're even getting into um, the reading of the book. Because as we know, learning to read is so complex that we want to set our students up for as much success experiences as possible. So if they have down pat how to navigate a book, that's going to help them when they start to focus on the word reading. Alconan boxes or sound boxes are another really great way that we can focus in on phonemic awareness before our students are actually reading words and we're just focusing on the sounds. So are students able to isolate sounds in simple words like consonant, vowel, consonant words um, like that? So are they able to figure out initial sound b, at, and then blend together bat? Now with Alconan boxes, generally it's meant to be a tactile experience for our students. So they're actually moving, here I have like unifix cubes, but it could be rocks or anything like that into the box as they're saying the sound. Um, and that's going to help them with um, having that, that sound identification and also directionality so that they can see that the B is going into the first, first square. And that's gonna help them with um, knowing initial sound and end and sounds and as well vowels. Another really wonderful way to work with our students is to work on cut up sentences. So having them come up with a sentence or even you know, scaffolding that and having us come up with a sentence to ensure that it is a simple one that they can put back together easily. Can they put the sentences back together as they're saying the words? Now, all of this is going to really help our students with so many different things. They're going to um, start to see the difference between letters and words, start to see that there's spaces in between words, start to notice punctuation, capital letters, um, directionality again, and, um, and all of that is really going to be important. Even if our students aren't reading words yet, they can still be probably noticing um, the, the different parts of the sentence that need to go to different places by beginning sounds, by letter recognition and word recognition. So those are all things that we can do really simply with our, our K-1 students that aren't yet ready to be reading books. Okay, and five minute fillers. So I love having a list of five minute fillers when I'm teaching just at the side of my desk. So I, if I have an extra five minutes, if I have an extra two minutes, I can make a really meaningful choice of um, setting up a literacy experience for my students. So it could be something easy, like you have a chart. Um, so you can do some quick interactive writing on, oh, we have you know, let's chart on teeth facts. That, what's, what can we add to it? And do some interactive writing around there. You can play I spy with my little eye, something that rhymes with that. Uh, we can retell the story that we just learned. Oh, we just had that really good story about um, um, brown bear, brown bear. What, what are some of the characters? Let's retell what characters we noticed in that book. Of course, word wall or word wall I spy is really great students to notice what and connect to what is in our word wall and who can think of a more interesting word than interesting vocab development no planning necessary these are all just things you can do off the top of your head so 
we know that you all have five minute fillers out there and how wonderful to share our five minute fillers with each other so that we can grow our list that we can do with our students. So if you could please think of a five minute filler that you love to go through. Um, oh, Rebecca's already put one in. Wonderful, thank you so much. I'm going to give you one minute and if you could pop those into the chat box and we can all learn from each other and gather some ideas. Oh, having kids group themselves in order it, with others whose name starts with the same letter, brilliant, or syllables, wonderful. Coming up with a word from A to Z on theme, oh, wonderful. These are so good. So I'd love to just gather these and create a document with all of our five minute fillers so that we can you know, have that on our Poppy website and, and share out when, uh, when anyone needs a five minute filler on literacy so that we can have that time as, as meaningful and intentional. Okay, so just as a closing activity today, what I'd like for you to do is think about how you're feeling right now. Hopefully you're feeling energized, you have ideas, you might feel feeling really creative. And um, by the end of September, September is a very long month. So at the end of September, our energy is sometimes a little bit lower. You know, we're starting to, we've built that class, classroom community. We're starting to think of, about initial assessments and things like that. So I want you to think of something that you're feeling today or a thought or an idea or an energy that you can write to yourself and remember to open on September 29th. Um, what do you want to remind yourself of? So I have, dear me, I'm at a provincial workshop and was asked to write myself a note to remind me something. You don't need to share it with us. This is all for you and for your sanity. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you another minute to quickly write that reminder to yourself. If you wanna share it in the chat box, feel free, but there's no need. This is all about you. Okay, so somewhere we're on that note that you made to yourself, right? September 29th. So you remember to revisit that, put it on your desk, Make sure that you see that reminder. Okay, so today we did a lot of work um, learning about or talking about creating a responsive and caring classroom through meeting, morning meetings, through learning spaces, celebrating our students' uniqueness. And um, we did, you know, focusing in on literacy activities like the signs of autumn, emergent writing development, our reading approximations, and our five minute fillers. So we would love to hear from you. What's one thing that you're most likely to try in your, in your classroom or in your role? And I will put a minute on the timer. Okay, here are the resources that we use to build your workshop today. If there's anything there you wanna check out, learn more about, feel free. And we just want to wish you all the best with the start of the, the school year next week and um, hold on to this feeling as, as much as you can and enjoy your kiddos.